Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 29. In this episode, I'm joined by Peter Sage. Peter is a serial entrepreneur, author, master trainer, international educator, philosopher and public speaker in the field of human behaviour, personal development and the psychology of success. Peter has started, founded and built over 20 companies over the last quarter of a century across a diverse variety of industries including the Energy Fitness Group and Worldwide Health Corporation. He's very humble to have shared the stage with various high profile people such as Kofi Annan, Sir Richard Branson, former US President Bill Clinton and many others. His client list includes several governments, members of royalty, Google and NASA. In this episode we're going to be talking about when Peter got the opportunity to put all of his personal development and human behavior knowledge to the test when he had a significant curveball thrown at him when he ended up in prison. We're going to be discussing the inside track. So Peter welcome to the show. Great to be here Well, excited to have a chat. So I talk all the time about surrounding yourself with like-minded people, people that have got similar interests, similar desires, people that want to, 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 to do similar things to you. And as the famous quote has been banded around by lots of different people, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I will be very open. I, I first heard about you years ago, observed you from afar, and then we'll get sort of into sort of some of the, the things that have happened with you in, 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 in years and in, in recent years. But the more that I've found out about you, the more I'm like, yes, this is someone who really does practice what he preaches. You know, lots of people, they, they, they talk about personal development. They, they teach personal development. They coach in personal development. But there's not necessarily areas where you can see that they've really taken it to an extreme and applied it, which I think it's fair to say you have. I mean, I, we, we heard on the intro a moment ago some of the things that you've done, but just a few extra that I've been in. So 25 years in business over 20 companies across 15 different industries. You spent 15 years as a Tony Robbins trainer. Um, you have run the likes of the Marathon de Sables, I think I say that right, which is uh, basically Sables. a Marathon de Sables, which is, it, which is like 250 kilometers across the desert, I believe I'm right in saying. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> um, you're, you're a black belt. You're an open water driver. You're a, diver. You're a skydiver. You've um, done shooting for the likes of Great Britain. You've been a British champion in rowing. You've had clients that consist of royalty, NASA, Google, the government, the United Nations. I mean, just to name a few. You've done a fair bit. Uh, I don't like to waste my time. I mean, we're we're, we're here in in this particular you know, time around for a finite amount of time. So, yeah, I'd uh, I'd hate to try to sit down and uh, and decide to retire. You know, probably when I'm 150 and don't move as well, but. Uh, right now, I want to get out and play and enjoy life, express life, the highs, the lows. The, you know, uh, I, I want to have the the last words out of my mouth if I'm lucky enough to choose them. Be wow, that that was starring in a movie I'd pay to see again. Yeah, and I I, I empathise with you. I, I'm I, I try personally to do quite a lot, and I like to do a lot because I enjoy the stuff that I do. So I choose the stuff that I like doing, and, and I choose to do it. And often I'll have people say to me, "Yeah, oh, will you get so much done? You do so much." but they don't understand why. And it's because of these reasons. And, and one of the things that I love on the, that, that I love to learn about, and I know that the listeners listening to this right now love to learn about from our guests is why they do what they do. Cause it's all well and good. And a lot of people go, Oh, it's just ego. You're chasing the, the next high, but often that isn't the case. And, and what I would love to know from you is why is it that you do what you do? And, and particularly in what you do in the, the likes of the, um, the, the business school and the other forms of personal and professional, professional development that you help people with? Well, it's, it's exactly the right question to ask because you know, we, we do things for reasons. Mm, may not be you know, your reasons, may not be my reasons, but you know, it's a psychological fact that people do things for reasons. And the, the level of experience that they get is governed by those reasons. You, know, you can have two people do the same job. One is passionate about it. One's bored out of their brain. It's not the job. Yeah, you can have one person step out in the rain and be thankful, and you can have one person step out of the rain and be pissed off. Yeah, it's yeah, you, you've got different reasons for why we do what we do, and most of the reasons are unconscious. Most of the reasons drive us from the background, and we're never really aware of them. We're too busy trying to respond to our feelings. So it's it's exactly the right question to ask, and it's the one most people never really answer from a place of authenticity because they don't know how to qualify why they do what they do. You ask them, so, well, I don't know, I just I just do. But you touched on a very interesting point. You know, if you're if you're chasing the next high out of ego, there are certain patterns. And one of the things working with you know, Tony for a decade and a half around the world 
it, were, it really got me to understand the patterns that are driving people. Because if you get good at spotting patterns, and there's only so many of them, you will be able to master yourself and others. You'll be able to master understanding others, you know, human behavior. And so you know, we, we could go an entire lifetime being driven by one level of insecurity that we're masquerading as a reason to do something that we're not aware is controlling us. Um, and you'll see that in people that do try to achieve too much. They're desperately trying to prove to the world that they're good enough. They're desperately trying to avoid the fear that they're not enough. Or they're, they're seeking skills in order to get certainty. And skills will never give you certainty. Skills will give you skills. Certainty will give you certainty. Mm. One is an externally referenced yeah, wild goose chase. The other is an internally referenced state of being. So you, know, you think, oh, well, when I get my MBA, then I'll have enough certainty to start a business. No, you won't. Mm. <laughs> right? You'll think, oh, now I've got an MBA. Oh, um, now I need something else. Now I need to have more money behind me before I risk it. Now I need to have, you know, go and work for somebody else and learn what I can in debt. You'll always come up with an excuse. So mm. why do we do what we do? And I'll show you my reason because it's never the same reason. Or it, I'll, I'll qualify that. If you're really trying to walk your path, it really shouldn't be the same reason along that path. Why? Mm. Because while we get to mature biologically, we don't get to choose that. You know, we're going to age. As I said, I'll retire when I'm 150, maybe. Right? But we do get to choose whether we grow or mature emotionally. And in my early, you know, late teens and early 20s, my why was exactly that. It was a, as a huge ego trip. It was desperately trying to prove to the world that I was good enough by covering up the insecurities as a young man that I felt that I wasn't. Yeah, and when I make my first million, then I'll prove to everybody that you know, I'll have made it. Well, guess what? Yeah, make my first million, and now I'm almost twice as scared in case I lose it. So, of course, I need two million. Right? Mm. That's why, because then if I lose one, at least I'll be okay. Had nothing before, and I was happier. You know, So, yeah, it's as, as you move forward... Yeah, in my mid-20s, I was a dick to work for. Why? I was a control freak. Why was I trying to control everything? Because I was afraid that if it didn't succeed and it failed, it would trigger the fear that I'm not enough. I would be exposed at yeah, some level. And yeah, from that perspective, uh, I, you know, I was on a journey of that frustrated achiever. Yeah, when, I, when I catch the next rabbit running around the track, which by design you can never catch if you're a greyhound, yeah, then I'll have made it. Well, no, then you'll have made it to the next level of frustration. Because, you know, I bought my first Ferrari at 25. And I was happy for about a week. Now, the reason that I was happy wasn't because I got my car that I've been putting on my vision board since I was 17. That's what I told myself. But the real reason I was happy is because I was stopped chasing. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, I like to smoke. No, you don't like to smoke. How do you tell me what I like to smoke? No, you like the feeling of no longer wanting to smoke or needing a cigarette. And your brain is linked smoking to, yeah, to that. And now you mis mistakenly label smoking as enjoyable. Whereas what's enjoyable is no longer craving. Ah, oh, it's, it's yeah, yeah, peel back the onion. So for me, the early days, my why was, yeah, how can I prove I'm good enough? Yeah, what's next? There's, there's no finish line on that game. Yeah, when you're chasing the more, there's no end yet. You're on a hamster wheel to uh, frustration. You climb to the top of that success mountain and very few people get to the top. But those that do, do you know what they do? They want to jump off. They don't like the view. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky in my sort of mid-late 20s to have, uh, it wasn't exactly a near-death experience, but it was a, it was a wake-up call. When I was driving home from the office about two o'clock in the morning as usual, to get my three, four hours sleep, to get back in at six, yeah, to, to run through the whole thing again. And I fell asleep, surprise, surprise. And I hit an intersection at 60 mile an hour. Actually, I was in, in the UK, so it was an island, we call it an island. You know? uh, and that, was, that almost took me out of the game. And I remember sitting at the side of the road thinking, whoa, what just happened? You know, I'm building a monster that's trapping me so that I can prove to a world that doesn't give a crap that I'm good enough Right. so that I can avoid some of the other patterns I see people run, which is, you know, be the victim. You know, I never want to be a victim. What was the alternative? Try to be an achiever. I didn't think there was a different way. But that, I became a victim of trying to be an achiever. 
<laughs> right? And it's, uh, it, was, it was an emotionally maturing moment. And if you want to put it in simple terms, uh, you've, you've done UPW, understand the six human need yeah, psychology. So I spent my entire first part of my life chasing the need for significance. Because I thought then I'd you know, avoid the fear that I was, wasn't enough. Instead, when I switched, realizing that nobody gives a crap about my own significance, they're too busy trying to get their own. And I started replacing that with growth and contribution. I started realizing that I actually feel better longer term putting a smile on other people's face. Why? It's in alignment with why we're here. We're here to grow and we're here to contribute. Now, in order to grow, how do you grow? Well, go to the gym. It'll tell you through challenge, through going past your comfort zone. That's why most people that seek comfort have a life of mediocrity or worse. Those that seek discomfort from a place of stretching beyond their comfort zone to seek more of who they can become, live a life most other people in the comfort zone look at and think, wow, you're so lucky. And then that, that piece there, it's, it's really interesting you say that because at the, the time of this, having this conversation, um, literally just weekend just gone, I did my first ever solo flight. And um, I've been learning to fly a plane and someone, put, and I shared it on social media and someone put um, on, on one of the social media things that the, the gifted will does it again or something. But the irony was I kind of laughed at myself because I thought I don't deem myself as gifted at all. I just work very hard. And what I'm taking from what you're saying there is it's not about being gifted. The significance, all the things that you do is because you've fallen in love with the process of constantly growing, getting out of your comfort zone, getting into discomfort, but doing it in a way that it contributes to others. And the irony is that the byproduct is that you get significance when you don't even want it anyway, because you're not doing it for those reasons. 100%. You, you virtually get it by osmosis. Mm. You know, I, I wanted to be a public speaker when I was younger and you know, I was a fast talking fidget head and uh, no one, I never thought anyone had add some value. I was petrified of my first few talks because I thought the audience would just you know, stone me to death. And uh, you know, it never happens, obviously, but in your mind, you, you make it happen. And yeah, I remember I was essentially chasing the validation, yeah, approval, good opinion of others, all of that stuff, and measuring it through standing ovations or you know, feedback forms, that kind of thing. Now, when I I finally gave up that, I thought, you know something? I don't care if they know my name. I don't care if they never see me again. I care about if I've got an hour of these people's time, they're willing to contribute. I want to offer something of value. I want to be able to help one person in that room take the next step that's their truth, that they didn't have the courage to take before, or the insight, or the know-how, or the tool, or the knowledge. And when I started focusing on how much value I can add, not how many ovations I can get, I started getting a lot more ovations. Didn't need it. Didn't need the ego stroke. I was, I was, very, I was humbled and very honored by it. But the correlation was unmistakable. Give up what it is that you're trying to get, replace it with an authentic joy for wanting to give, and you'll find out that you get what it is you gave up. Hello, secrets of life. And one of the things that you just touched on there, so first of all, let's, so thank you for sharing that. And and, and like you say, it was literally the the crash that woke you up, you know, it's uh, the, the that in, in that instance. Um, in terms of, um your mission now so your 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 mission the overarching mission for for people that are here i, I referred something as a north star but your, your mission in life what, what is that now essentially to help raise the global consciousness of humanity now that sounds airy it sounds lofty it sounds nebulous so I let, let me give a little bit more context and make it a little more definitive a little more concrete as to what that means because you know einstein said you know one of his most famous quotes certainly one of his most powerful was that you can't solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created it. And a lot of people think that, wow, that sounds smart. And it does, but people don't know how to use that to pay their mortgage on Friday. Mm. So let me break it down. When, when it comes up for consciousness, because on, on one side of the fence, yeah, if you're a materialist, left brain, Newtonian paradigm, you think that consciousness is a byproduct of brain function, which it isn't, never has been, never will be, never been proven it can't be. Why? Because it doesn't work. The brain doesn't produce consciousness any more than the television produces programs. So on the other side, the reason that a lot of people crave the left brain certainty aspect of that is because on the other side, it's a little bit too esoteric. 
you know, let's all, you know, sing Kumbaya to the divine and, you know, go do crystal healing. Well, you know, pe people can't get a, a concept around that a lot of the time. So consciousness is kind of this 13 letter conundrum that a lot of people don't know how to navigate. But I want to give a framework and then you'll see how this fits in. See, I, I try to chunk it down into a, a model. And remember, models are just models. They're useful to the extent that you can get practical benefit, but they're not the truth with a capital T, because the truth with a capital T is we don't know the damn truth. But when it comes to consciousness, I put it into four levels. The lowest level is what we spoke about earlier, about it's that of victimhood. And that's what I call to me. And to me is yeah, that the mantra goes, well, I would have the world, you know, the life, I would be able to be a pilot, I would be able to do this, but everything happens to me. It's, it's the, the, the mantra of victim. You think life owes you a living, you think it's tipping crap all over you, and you try to basically use your victimhood to justify a lack of courage for being able to break out of your victimhood. And one thing I've learned through working with a lot of victims and helping them out there is the day they realize that 80% of people don't care about your problems and the other 20% are glad you have them is the time you start letting go of the victim story or how to out victim the next victim. So to me is never really a great place to hang out. So just, just to interrupt before we go into the, the next um, one, one of the things that I, I know that you talk about, and I, I'm guessing it fits in this section. So maybe now we, we, um, we, we touch on it is that why people stay in to me, like victim mode, which is the secondary gain of, victim mode right there's two reasons really one is learned helplessness they, they just have got so used to it their baseline consciousness is where they live that there's no aspiration because you know if, if you live in a hole that's 20 feet deep and you know smooth walls and no ladder at some point you stop trying to climb out because you don't think it's possible so you have a level of learned helplessness now then you have people that are sitting at the bottom of that you know uh, uh, that that hole that are basically shouting to everybody else why they're lucky you know, out there and you're not lucky in here and it's the world's fault and you know, the hole's too deep and you, know, you don't deserve it and all of this kind of stuff. They're, they're the people that are getting the significance by how big a problem they have because they can't get significance anywhere else. Mm. Now, they don't have a significant education, job, status, amount of money, relationship, significantly decent body to you know, carry around you know, their, their consciousness in, but they have a significant problem. So now... Yeah, I can come to the table, yeah, get the idea. But yeah, it's it, the second you start giving up blame, which doesn't work anywhere in nature, and replace it with personal responsibility, you can move to the next level, which is by me. By me is where most of the entrepreneurs hang out. By me is where most of the achievers hang out. Yeah, that's the race that's going on on Success Mountain to the top. Yeah, because if it's going to happen, it's going to happen by me. I don't need none of this, you know, waiting for my ship to come in, hoping one day that, you know, some fairy dust gets sprinkled and my life works. No, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going for it. Get out of my way. Yeah. I'm setting goals. I've got my thumb out of my ass and I'm going to 10 X my life. That's your typical mantra. And it's a damn sight better position to be in than to me. The challenge with that is it's exhausting. You're not doing it out of fun. You're not doing it. It's your truth. You're doing it because you're frustrated about trying to get somewhere that you don't currently think you are. And yeah, that's stress, heart attack, missing your kids grow up, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's the cosmic joke of, of the entrepreneur. You know, I'm going to give up uh, a huge portion of my life, sacrifice my health, my relationship, my family, my kids, all the rest of it, so that hopefully one day in my mind, I can create a big enough score so that, well, so that what? So that you can now pay for your divorce. So you can now hire a decent personal trainer to get your health back, buy your kids loads of stuff so that they love you again. I mean, it's, it's a joke. But by me is where most people hang out in personal growth. In fact, most strategies in personal growth are teaching you how to be, yeah, run fast around the track to catch a rabbit that by design you can't catch. Because even if you catch it, what you're actually trying to catch is the rabbit of fulfillment, which by the way, never exists on the track of achievement. Okay? Can't catch it by design. Greyhounds don't catch the rabbit on the dog track, not because they're not fast enough, because the game is rigged by design that you can't catch it. So let me say it again in case the, the listeners missed it. You cannot catch the rabbit of fulfillment by running on the track of achievement. And I would much rather be a fulfillionaire than a millionaire. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that, that's the buy me. And I was in there in my 20s. Dang, don't get me wrong. And I was damn good at it. 
you know, I was buying Ferraris for cash. I was flying Concord. I was doing all kinds of stuff at you know, my early mid twenties that my school friends I went with would have thought I was Branson on two. I felt like an abject failure inside because you know, I was still wasn't good enough. But uh, I finally on that car crash, essentially woke up to the fact there's another level. And that's the level of through me. Through me is where life flows through you. You are now attracting things into your sphere. The, the, the non-physical is doing the heavy lifting. And again, people think that's esoteric. Well, I'm sorry, but there is a non-physical rule set as much as there is a physical rule set. The fact that we can see and experience the physical rule set through measurement with the physical senses doesn't negate that the superset, if you like, is non-physical. How do I know that? It's a pretty obvious deduction. Everything in the physical world is destination is non-physical. Hmm? Where did the universe come from? Well, according to the physical scientists, it magicked itself out of nothing. Give me a break. You know, it's like it came from a non-physical state. Where do particles disappear in and out of the ether from? We have no idea. You know, so what makes us us is the non-physical. It's your you know, um, hopes, dreams, personalities, desires, sense of humor. It's your goals, your vision, you know, who you are as a person. None of that you can put in a matchbox and sell. It's non-physical. So when we start to realize that you know, when we can work with a rule set, so imagine, well, imagine that you didn't know there was a correlation between diet and body shape. Imagine that awareness wasn't within your sphere of knowledge. Wow. You'd be turning around to your friends and say, oh my God, I don't get it. I'm putting on all this weight. I've had to buy another pair of jeans, another size up. Pass me a double cheeseburger, will you? I mean, that, that knowledge would be, you know, to somebody else, obvious. But so many people don't understand the correlation between the mental diet and what happens in your life. They're walking around saying, oh, I can't believe it. Lost my job. Oh, I can't believe it. Can I just, you know, this has happened. This person left me. Oh, uh, pass me another giant negative cheeseburger to munch on, will you, mentally? It's, it's, it's obvious when you understand the rule set. And for a lot of people, and I, I'll be the first to admit this, many years ago, I associated, and it was association, the word consciousness with the, the spiritual people sitting on hills in tie-dyed trousers and, and sort of that extreme. But another word for consciousness is just awareness. Awareness. That's yeah. really what we're talking about, isn't it? It's awareness. It's having awareness and, and being able, the more perspectives that you can have, the more that you can see, so to speak, then the, the, the more that you can be able to um, influence life in the way that you want to feel because that's really what it comes down to right no matter what happens and i think now is probably a, a good time to bring in and this this kind of comes back to one of the reasons i really wanted to have this conversation is that having personal development and reading books and doing courses and knowing this stuff is one thing but ultimately that's where i'm a big fan of stoicism because the stoics learned stuff and applied it in the game of life it wasn't to go and sit in a temple somewhere and try and create peace and tranquility from from not playing the the game of life because ultimately that's kind of why we're here that's certainly my opinion anyway um and not so long ago you had what i'm going to assume was your most testing opportunity um to date to be able to apply all of the personal development and the lessons and the teachings and the trainings that you've done and taught for many decades yes and uh, and hopefully that just gives a, a little bit of a framework to to some of the audience that uh puts context around that the mission you know to, to raise global consciousness if i can get people from to me to buy me or or what my my uh, essential prime position in the marketplace is, if you want to frame it that way, is I take people from by me to through me. That's my speciality. That's where I live. Yeah. You'll get your Tony Robbins of the world, which is like either to me to buy me or low buy me to high buy me. You know, your Grant Cardone's, your Gary V's, your Dan Penny's, they're all in by me and teaching you how to run fast around the track to catch more rabbits so that hopefully one day you'll feel significant until you realize you don't. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I've, I've played the game. I don't play the game anymore. I'm about how do we get people that know there's a better way to work with the, the rule set that governs fulfillment instead of yeah, 
achievement. And there's, there's a big difference there. But yes, uh, we, as we are in what I call Earth School, you know, we will have what I call graduation events. And graduation events are designed to test, can you walk your talk? If you're a relationship coach, expect to have problems with your partner. Why? Because theory doesn't cover the price of admission to the higher levels of greatness. Yeah, to quote Bruce Lee, you can't learn to swim on dry land. Go read whatever book you want. But at some point, you've got to get wet. And so if you're in person development, expect to be tested by life, the universe, you know, the three-letter word we kill each other over historically, whatever, you know, pick a label, I don't mind. You know, we, we don't know what that intelligence is because, say, hey, truth of the capital T. But at some point, you're going to get tested. Why? It's the nature of the classroom we're in. And if you're looking at life through a comfort-centric lens, you're going to get slapped. Yeah, if you're not living your life's purpose, you're going to continue to get your ass kicked. Have you not figured that out yet? So you know, from my side, uh, I, we have graduation events. And you mentioned it was probably my toughest. To be fair, probably the toughest was losing my parents. Um, because again, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's levels and levels. And a lot of people have, have already had that kind of graduation event too. And others, hopefully it'll happen. And I say hopefully because it's every parent's wish their children outlive them. Yeah. So when it comes to the graduation event, I think you're referring to, I think you're talking about my little um, uh, sabbatical in yeah. what was Britain's, <laughs> Britain's most violent prison, Pentonville in North London. Uh, as the only non-criminal, I'll, uh, I'll chip in to add. Yeah, I'm, I'm a business guy. I've, I've been in business since I was 17. Yeah, official business, yeah, way before that, before unofficially. But yeah, I was arguing a multi-million dollar years old business deal in court with a multi-billion dollar firm and they threw a contempt of court application at me, which I really didn't see as a threat. I thought it was a chess move. Yeah, any entrepreneurs listening here will understand when it comes to litigation, civil actions are essentially a tool. It's just a, a positioning tool. It's a bargaining tool. It's, you know, we're, we're, it's, a, it's a move on the chessboard. But when you're a multi-billion dollar company that can hire a hundred million dollar ruthless law firm, you know, that is essentially Princess Diana's divorce lawyers, then... Yeah, I'm, I'm a little outgunned. Yeah, I'm not even bringing a, a knife to a, a, a gunfight. I'm bringing a Budweiser ring pull. You know, I'm, uh, I was on legal aid because they froze my accounts. So I, I had not a lot of yeah, chance in that scenario because anyone that's been to court knows it's got, it's got nothing, zero, to do with who's right or wrong. It's who can win. Nobody walks into court with the agenda to lose. And yeah, whoever wins is usually whoever can hire the best storytellers, because that's what it is. It's courtroom theater you know, when it comes to litigation. Anyway, uh, I, they sold it to the judge. I got six months as uh, the only civil non-criminal prisoner. Again, non-criminal means I've, I've never been arrested. I haven't been accused of a crime. I've not been found guilty. I still don't have a criminal record associated to any of that. But I found myself unsegregated in you know, 1,300 criminals in, in Pentonville. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't see that one coming, to, to be honest. Uh, lost my business, got awarded costs against me, which was hundreds of thousands. I mean, I just, it, was, it was a crap show. I lost everything. Uh, my wedding, they put charging order against my home. If I wasn't able to pay in a certain amount of time, they're going to snatch me on that. You get the idea. So, yeah, I was, uh, that was a fun test. <laughs> so let's go into that then, because, like you say, it, it was a test and there's lots of ways that you frame it in a way that, has enabled you to to deal with that but your book and, and we're going to talk about the book later inside track so I, I'll, I'll say this hand on my heart i've read hundreds of books personal development professional development hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and and genuinely uh, uh, this is one of the top 10 books that i've read because it's got what i deem lots of the key lessons but then importantly you're showing in real time how you're applying these because the, the book is essentially you sharing how you're dealing with your six months in prison in in the one of the uh, what what's the, the so i know it's pentonville but the it, the with the most violent prison is in the uk yeah yes yeah. in the uk statistically the most violent yeah so obviously the type of people we're talking gangsters murderers the, these types of 100 yeah. percent yeah and, in, Rape, and you're in there. drugs violent crime organized crime yeah they're, the, they're not the sort of people you invite to see your parents uh, yeah and you obviously share how you go through this but there was some quite eye-opening moments now obviously we're limited on time but if you were to pick the if the, you were to pick three key moments 
in there that enabled you to be able to to deal with it in the way that you did because there's loads that you cover in the book and we'll be talking about the book shortly but what what would those key things be for people because let's apply it because not everybody's going to prison right now of course yeah. they're not but ultimately what we do all experience is a curveball that we wasn't expecting that we fear because ultimately i believe that all fear boils down to two things it's gaining something you don't want or losing something you do want and in this instance that it was both right you gained lots of things you didn't want i.e potential of stigma and reputation and all that good stuff and losing things like you mentioned your wedding and businesses and things like that um so yeah the the, the process of doing that but then obviously some of the things that were very interesting that you've learned that you've continued to do that have enabled you to um i suppose grow and evolve your own consciousness since yeah uh three key moments i and again there, there were many i actually had 200 magic moments that i, I recorded while i was i was a, on my little field trip but the first one has to be at the point where i was sentenced because we you know, we didn't walk into court expecting any it was such an outlier i mean there's no way when I mean, who who gets and it was an 18 month sentence and as a civil prisoner you do automatic half so 9 months uh, i appealed they dropped it to 12 months so i served six but who gets an 18 month sentence for a civil yeah, a contempt of court action? That's nobody, not unless you're like hiding tens of millions of dollars or, yeah, I don't know, taking a pee over the pulpit onto the judge. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So it, it was an outlier from the start. Uh, didn't expect it, didn't see it coming. And as soon as it, you know, it was evident that that was happening, I had to make a very quick decision. And the, the, the first decision I had to make was down to identity. Who was I going to be in this moment? Not what was I going to do? Everybody thinks what they're going to do, but what you're doing is governed by who you're being. Yeah, what you do is go to yeah, the vegetarian restaurant because of who you are as a vegetarian. Mm. Yeah, what you do is go chat up the girl because you're a heterosexual man. Yeah, it's, you know, the, uh, what you do is based on who you are. Yeah, if I was a homosexual man, I'd go chat up a, a, a guy. Yeah, it's, it's behavior follows identity in terms of how you are now, if I wanted to be a, uh, a victim, a prisoner, that's an identity. And prisoners, by definition, often drop very quickly into the to me level of consciousness, victim mentality, victim of the system, victim of the judge, victim of the freaking yeah, policeman that caught me, you know, whatever it is, fill in the blank. Yeah. And that leads to a lot of cancerous self talk, you know, if only, what if, and all of this kind of stuff. I knew I had to pick an empowering identity. And so the identity I chose, I, I said to myself, you know, I've, I've spent 25 years at that point being able to help people in personal growth. But the people that I could probably help the most maybe never get to see my talks online or attend my events or what have you, because they're in somewhere like jail. Don't have the resources, don't have the peer group, don't have the awareness, the knowledge, the exposure. So what if the universe is trying to get me to go help people that I'd never normally get to see? Wow, what an opportunity that is. So I never went in as a prisoner. I went in as a secret agent of change. Let's go see if I can make a difference. Let's see if all the stuff I teach on stage and you know, or in a studio with fancy second takes and cameras and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, let's go show my students that theory doesn't cover the price of admission to the higher levels of greatness. And so I went as a secret agent. And that was the first most defining moment and I carried that in right from being in the holding cells of the courts, the Royal Courts of Justice in London. Yeah, I, was, I made a mission to try to make all the staff smile. I mean, you can imagine the kind of environment they normally work in. They've just had somebody who thought they could probably walk or whatever get sent down. And now they're sat in a holding cell, bitching, moaning, and not being in a happy place. I got excited that I'm starting an adventure, which at that time I thought was going to be nine months. Yeah, I, I can't change anything that's happened. Yes, I'm going to lose my business, lose my reputation, lose my wedding, lose yeah, God knows what. Yeah, I lose my house, but damn, I'm going to make the best of this mission. Did you decide that that quickly? Like literally from the moment that they, the judge said it to you walking down to the holding cell, you're like, I'm making this decision. This is going to be, this is, this is my identity as I am a change agent and I'm going to make this nine months, the most fun nine months, the most life-changing nine months for other people. You made it that quickly. Uh, I, I adopted it that quickly. I thought about it when I saw the, the, the hearing starting to go south. And, right. and it first started dawning on me that, hang on a minute, what if I go away here? Because that wasn't yeah. on radar, right? What would I do? 
well, mm. I'd have no choice. I'd have to step up. What's the best mm. way to do that? Well, I'd have to go give my gift inside. And so, yeah, but there's always the option of, oh, yeah, I'm, surely I'm walking out of this, right? And then, no, I'm sorry, boom, goodbye. I'm like, boom, okay, yeah, plan A, here we go, I'm in. So yeah. number one, to, uh, uh, choose your identity, because that's the beauty is a lot, of, I mean, I, I'm sure you'll agree with this, I am are the two most powerful words in the English language, right? The, the identity that we take on and that we hold, what you say you are, you are. You know, so if anything, if you're saying I am no good at X, Y, Z, or I am a prisoner, then people take on that identity and then they take on the beliefs and the values. Um, they, yeah, they take on the beliefs and the values and the, the skills and the environment of all of those things that happen in, in that instance. But by having that identity is, is, a, is a key part. I'll, I'll give you an example that might help some of the audience. I mean, we, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that, yeah, or yeah, especially online these days, that feel that they want to write a book. Yeah, you know, whether they use that for a lead magnet or credibility or position, or just because they, they're passionate about wanting to share something. Okay. And a lot of them just don't have the time. And that's because their identity is I'm an entrepreneur who's trying to write a book. The second you switch your identity to, no, I'm an author. What do authors do? Authors write. Now your sense of internal prioritization is prioritizing your book over your meetings, it's prioritizing your book over your business. But if you're an entrepreneur trying to write a book, good luck. If you're an author who's also running a business, you're going to get your book done. Make sense? Yeah, 100% for sure. So number one was you chose your identity and that kind of happened as, like you say, as the hearing was kind of going south. What was the second pivotal moment that enabled you to thrive in that situation? Uh, I think it was actually when, when I got there uh, and I was in the, uh, <laughs> it's funny, I, the first person I saw after I got out of the van you know, in, in handcuffs was the uh, the, the prison officer that was checking me in, if you like, and giving me my, my uniform, which luckily in England isn't orange. Uh, so I've got my little like gray tracksuit. And he basically said, um, can I ask you a question? I said, so he says, are you a copper? I'm like, no, and please don't mention that to anyone else. Cause like, that's mm. not a good label to be walking in here with apparently. Uh, he says, I don't know something about you. You just seem too calm. Mm. Right. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Chatting away. I'm in the processing you know, waiting room, if you want, with, I don't know, maybe a dozen, 15 people that have either come in from other courts or transfers or whatever. And I go see the doctor. And the doctor, after about three hours, you know, he calls me in and for my medical. And, and we're chatting away. And he says, uh, can I ask you a question? So sure. I says, um, are you undercover? And I start laughing. I says, you're the second person that's, that's you know, ask me that. I says, why do you ask? 30 years of being a prison doctor. He says, I have never seen anyone so happy, calm, relaxed, and joyful on their first ever day in prison, right? And, uh, and I told him why I thought I was there. But anyway, one of the, 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 the second defining moment really was when I was in the waiting room, waiting to be processed or, or go to you know, the first night holding cells, whatever. And there was a guy there, kind of a tough guy. Yeah, he was quite loud, opinionated, you know, shaved head, goatee, kind of, you know, you, you, if you were casting for a movie, you'd put him in there. You get the idea. And his name was Jamie. And he was chatting and yeah, well, not chatting. he was kind of being loud and, and threatening a little bit of some of the others and whatever. And I thought, I, I see a guy here that's so scared underneath the bravado macho trying to prove blah, 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 define himself. Probably never had a hug growing up. Yeah. Probably never had a, a, an approval word from his dad. Yeah. All of this kind of stuff. And I thought, I'm gonna see if I can help this guy. Now, hey, it's my first, first test. Yeah, I've been in prison for what, two hours? I'm in the waiting room. And so I get my patent interrupt. I, I built some rapport. You know, I've been talking about his kid. And I sort of jumped in, you know, how old's your boy and blah, blah. Anyway, and um, we got talking and I was, he was talking about how the food was crap. And you know, he, he wanted to start a deli, but he'd never got the chance. And if he ran his deli, which was his dream, then he'd be able to beat prison food down, all this kind of And I got him talking about it. I got him started believing it. I started to reframe how he could use this as an opportunity to demonstrate to his young boy, three years old, that no matter what happens to you, you can come out stronger. And imagine how your boy feel coming out, starting that deli and going to prove to the world and all those other you know, idiots out there that you, you, you're trying to prove against that you are good enough. You really think so? You think I could do it? I says, I've known you five minutes. I think you can do it. I says, and if you go ask the people that really know you and care about you, they'll tell you exactly the same. All right, but imagine, imagine naming a sandwich after your boy. 
Oh, what's his name? His name's Kane. The Kane Sandwich. Yeah, whatever. You know, you're just painting pictures of possibility, inspiring people. And he left on cloud nine. He he actually uh, dialed me in. I saw him in the exercise yard a couple of days later. And he came up to me and says how much of an impact and uh, and all of that. I'm like, I can actually make a difference in here. These are just people. Yeah, people say, oh, prison's full of bad people. No, it isn't. It's full of a lot of good people that have made bad decisions. And therefore, the grace of God go I. And you could have been born any one of those circumstances that would have led you to make the same decisions they had. Because people do things for reasons. And you know, at the time, good or bad, you know, we, we suffer consequences later. But at the time, you know, nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to deliberately screw up my life today. Let's go out and you know, make poor choices. No, they, they're coping, they're surviving, they're dealing with, they're reacting, they're, they're, they're trying to avoid fear yeah, or try to get something that'll cover up yeah, some of the level of insecurity or to get approval, validation, connection, significance. We, we know the game. And, and so, yeah, it, that was a, a real pivotal moment. It's like, yeah, I'm here. I, you know, first little test. I know I, can, I know this will work. I know I can make a difference. No, I didn't get stabbed. Yay, win. You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, so that, that was another a really strong moment. Uh, and then, uh, and there's, I say so many moments, but I guess the third one was when after a, <clears throat> a week or so, I started getting, I, I wrote the, the letters, as you mentioned, yeah, which are now the book, the, the Inside Track. And every two weeks, I, I wrote to my senior coaching students that were paying me, you know, big money before I went away to learn all the stuff I've been teaching. And I basically invited them on the journey with me. And I wrote these private letters and there's 11 of them. And it, it's, you know, it's what we published when I came out because it changed so many lives. And when I heard the feedback and I was hearing the feedback from the people on the outside on how much of a difference it was making to them from me sharing what was going on inside and how I was dealing with the tools I was using, the psychology I was using, how to, how to do something in, you know, that I've been teaching on stage, but in a real life scenario. Yeah, how do you get somebody to stop killing themselves that's committed to doing it in under five minutes and have them be committed to that permanently, not just in the moment, which you can change anybody in, in, in the moment. Yeah, how do you stop or diffuse people that are about to erupt into violence with weapons and get yourself subtly invited into the conversation, maintaining the illusion of significance for those that are trying to seek it, essentially pull out the energetic rug from underneath it and have them all become friends while, and then disappear as if nothing happened. Yeah, th this, is, this is stuff that I'd spent decades learning and I finally got the chance to prove it outside of the classroom at where the stakes are much higher. And if I can do it in prison, the message was, you know, you've got no excuse when your spouse comes home upset from work because they got downsized or your daughter's you know, crying because she had a tough time at school or, or whatever it may be. And, and when I started seeing not just the impact that the letters were having on my students, but the people they were sharing them with. And I was getting tens of letters a day, uh, not hundreds a day, but definitely tens of letters a day and hundreds over the course of, of the time I was in there. I still have them. And from people I'd never met, from countries I'd never been to, telling me how much of a difference what I was doing inside was making, that was a pivotal moment. Uh, and being able to do what I did, and again, without getting into too much of the detail, you know, I, I created a movement you know, as there. I redesigned the intake system to reduce violence uh, between the wings that's now being used in prisons all over the world. Uh, and as we're recording this right now, I don't know when this will be put out, but last week I signed a deal to get the inside track into the hands of 300,000 US prisoners in the States. And um, there's a, a charity I'm working with there that you know, we've just got in and they, they provide the, the tablets, you know, like an iPad, but you know, for, for learning. And uh, I've just done, uh, agreed the, uh, the ebook version of the inside track. We have to make sure there's no external links and a few other you know, tweaks, et cetera. But we just signed it on one push of a button that gets downloaded to 300,000 prisoners as a test before we can hit, you know, close to six, 700,000 of the next two months. So, you know, the legacy is leaving. I mean, I won a national award for, for the work that I did while I was in there. I mean, it was, it was probably one of the most empowering, incredible adventures I've ever had the privilege of living. Which is not how most people would describe going to prison. And when I came out, people said, oh, wow, you came out and, uh, and look at you now. Yeah, you know, this is four years ago. Yeah, you know, I came out of prison a third of a million dollars in debt. I had zero credit rating. Yeah, I, I couldn't pay my credit cards. I was, I, I was the first American Express Centurion card holder in the UK, charter member. Yeah, I had a million dollar credit limit with Amex. I will never get an, uh, another Amex card. Let's just put it that way. 
Yeah, I had a zero. I went from a multi-decade 999 credit rating to couldn't open a bank account, couldn't get a credit card, couldn't get a checkbook. I, I had my hands tied behind my back and I owed 300 grand that if I didn't clear would have backfired in, in much worse ways. And I, I, I you know, lost a relationship, lost, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that happened out of there that was testing. You know, it's not all smiles and roses and, and happy prisoner stories. You know, there's a lot of testing times. I write about the times I cried, the times I doubted myself, the times I, you know, I, I hit depression for you know, brief moments. And when I came out, I had to literally not start from scratch. I had to start from a third of a million in the hole with no assets, no nothing, no credit rate. I was excited. I've never dug myself out of a hole that deep. This should be fun. Yeah, that was exactly, okay, I'm, how can I focus on being able to add value? How can I pay back the people? The first thing is how, the people that have bought tickets to my seminars that got canceled. How can I make them whole? Yeah, the, 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 the lawsuit can wait, right? I, I, I want to go and add value to those people. How can I give them some assurance that I'm going to, it takes me 20 years, I'll, I'll sort it out. And yeah, it took me 18 months to, to pay back everybody else. It took me another year to clear the, the legal debt. And yeah, I, I remember I moved to Tenerife three years ago. So it was a year after I came out. And uh, uh, I essentially landed with one month rent in the bank. I climbed to, to probably about a you know, quarter of a million in debt at that point. And sat here today, you know, debt-free, 85 people in the business, you know, running you know, multi, you know, eight figures. Yeah, and, uh, and same guy. Lose everything tomorrow, good excuse to go again. I'm, I'm touched and privileged I had the opportunity to do that because the book, which I had no idea, it was never written as a book. You know, this isn't written after the fact. This is real time unfolding day by day. As sort of like it's part diary, part how to manual, trade craft, and part you couldn't make it up, but it's real. <laughs> yeah. To be able to have that impact on so many people that I'd never been able to do. I've been trying to write a book for three years prior to that. I just need a government sponsored book writing course to do it on. Yeah. Called Six Month in Prison. But yeah, I, I, when I came out, my student says, you have to publish this. Uh, I'm like, guys, this, this, these are private letters. And then they, they, again, they shared how much it had impacted how for the people they'd shared it with. I'm like, that's my hot button. Let's do it. And I think we went uh, bestseller in two hours, Amazon number one in four hours. We outsold three suppliers on the first day. We sold to 42 countries on the first day. And again, if you check any review on Amazon, Goodreads, Kindle, audio, you know, uh, Audible, it's changed the life of pretty much everyone that's read it. I mean, what do you say? And I've already said it, but it, it genuinely goes in as, as one of the top 10 books that that i've read in the personal development space and 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 look people are going to be listening now they're going to go right how can i get this now yes people can go to amazon of course they can do that but we've got a little incentive for them to not go to amazon that will help them out and and, and how can people what is that and how can people get access to it well we're seeing the difference as to how much this has made and coming back to the question you asked about what's my mission and what drives me i want to raise global consciousness this book does that if you allow it to and I mean, if you're in victim mode and you're committed to staying there, it's not going to help. You know, use it as a doorstop. But <clears throat> when it comes to people that are really looking for a map, you know, when, when you're in a maze and you have a map, you're no longer in a maze. Uh, but if you don't have a map, everything's a maze. So uh, the book offers a map to that level of fulfillment, understanding how to deal with adversity, how to, how to yeah, really become your best when life hits you with the bat. And so I want to get it into as many hands as possible. You can go to Amazon. It's 20 pounds sterling, 29.95 US, uh, uh, sorry, 24.95 US. And we've set aside 500 copies for, for you and your tribe. And I, I will say this, that it costs me hard costs, being completely transparent, about $14. That's to have the books printed, to have them shipped to the warehouse, to have them stored, to have them picked, and then to have the you know, postage to, to send it to your doorstep. So all in all, cost of goods sold on that is about $14. So you know, on $20 US, we, we make about $8 profit. I've set aside 500 books. I'm willing to take $4 hit. That's $2,000 I'm investing in trying to help your, you know, the, the people that you support because that's my gift now that I'm back on top and doing well. Uh, there has to be, in other words, you pay me $9.95 and I'll, I'll send you a copy you know, with my compliments. Now, there has to be some level of fair exchange. Now, if you don't pay, you don't pay attention. Uh, you know, if, I'm not going to say, oh, here's a free book, call and get it for nothing, because then it's going to sit on the shelf. Right? Get, get, get me, pay, show me you're serious about wanting to learn, and I'll basically cut the price more than in half and, and do my share of the heavy lifting. Uh, and if you want that, then, yeah, we put a, a link together. 
getpeatsbook.com forward slash will, W-I-L-L. And uh, I've got 500 copies for your readers. I'm, I'd love to hear the feedback for your, for your listeners. Absolutely. So what we've done, guys, head to the show notes down below, whether you're watching this on YouTube or on iTunes or whatever it is that you're listening to, any of your devices in the show notes, there'll be the link where you can just go to that, click on that and get that book now. So thank you very much for that, Peter. My absolute um, pleasure. All, all I want is a, a genuine yeah, feedback on, yeah, give me a review, share with it what it's done for you. And, uh, and let's see if yeah, together we can help some more people. So one final thing to, to leave on, because we've, we've touched on it a, a lot, and it's one of the big pieces of work that I do with clients. It's something I'm extremely um, inspired to do, which is fulfillment. Now, if right now, for, for people that listen to this, we've touched on it, and obviously the book, and people can go away, they can read the book, and they can, they, they can learn so much in, in so many different ways. But right now, if someone's feeling a bit meh, and they're not unfulfilled, and they're feeling what you might deem unfulfilled, what would be a, a tip for people to leave with to look at making that shift for them for us to finish on obviously there's many different paths from different people to get to that particular point for their own reasons but two of the most common usually one is around money uh and the yeah the other is around just feeling like life has no purpose Uh, you you have you've ran out of meaning and for for the money side one has to understand most people chase money because they don't understand it and to have an abundance mentality so that you can be third of a million in debt and still happy is, is a, something, it's a choice, but it, it needs a mental shift. And so when I talk about abundance, a lot of people associate abundance to stacks of money in the bank. They don't have a figure for it, so therefore they'll never reach it because they can't quantify it. In fact, for abundance, most people's definition of abundance is more than, yeah, I have right now, <laughs> right? And no matter what's in the bank. Uh, you know, I work with somebody worth 700 million, miserable because they're not a billionaire. That game never ends. For me, abundance is having more than I need, not more than I have. And if you want more than you have, you're never going to get there. It's a tunnel with no cheese. More than I need, right? I, I don't need an extra yacht to prove to people I'm X, Y, Z. Yeah, if I've, yeah, I have some nice things now, but I was just the same guy without them. I'm not going to take them with me. Yeah, so... One is about check your definition of abundance. If you don't have abundance mentality, it's probably because you grew up with scarcity around money or you saw mom and dad fighting over it and you unconsciously link you know, lack of connection or safety to you know, discussions of money. So you want to unconsciously give it away or block yourself from having it. Or you were told you weren't good enough and therefore you, uh, yeah, you, you don't feel worthy of it. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, when it comes to meaning, it's pretty simple. Most people that feel their life has no meaning is because they're too focused on themselves. You start framing what you can give, like on stage. I don't want standing ovation. I want to add value. I want to change somebody's life. I want to be able to offer something that somebody can go, wow, an aha moment. Thousand people in the audience and one person gets an aha moment. Damn good reason for showing up. Yeah, it's not about me. It's about, you know, what, how can I serve? You start taking the attention off yourself and start putting it on what you can give or you know, what you can do from a place of authentic contribution, not from a, a strategy to try to find meaning. You know, it's gaming the system. It doesn't work. But you do that, and you'll start to realize that you know, there's a lot of joy that you've been missing out on because you've been too busy looking in the mirror. Love that. Thank you very much. So yeah, having that abundance mindset, very much focusing on having more than you need rather than having more than you want, essentially. And um and, and then being able to essentially, we spoke around right back and having that growth, having that contribution element of being able to serve others in whichever way that that, um, well, whichever way that that, that looks. Well, Peter, thank you so much. And obviously the book, guys, head to go and get the book. You'll thank me for it. Um, and you'll definitely be thanking Peter for it. Um, uh, it. It really is phenomenal. So go and head to that and get that and benefit from the, the kind offer that, um, that that Peter's offered there. Um, if people do want to connect with you, where can people find you, connect with you and all that? Um, I'm, I'm pretty there. much all over. I mean, petersage.com is uh, the website on there. You can follow me on Instagram, petersage007. Uh, make sure it is my, my account. Yeah, uh, you know, If it's got less than 70,000 followers, it's fake. Uh, and there's a lot of those out there, unfortunately, hijacking influences, credibility and approaching people for scams and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, make sure it's my account. Uh, on there and yeah i'm i'm here to help you know i've got 
a lot of free stuff I put out there because I know people are struggling right now. I've got obviously some paid stuff as well if people want to take it up a notch. But yeah, uh, more than anything, I just like being able to come on to platforms like you have here, Will, and you know the, the amount of time and effort you've put in on creating value for your tribe. It's just beautiful to be invited to be a part of it. So thank you. Oh, and thank you again for coming. So guys, make sure you go do that. Connect with Peter on socials, get the book. Peter, once again, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And uh, until next time, make it happen. Stay amazing. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. Make sure you join Will's free Facebook group, the Make It Happen community. Please support the show by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Share this episode with at least one friend you think would benefit from it and give Will a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. Until next time, make it happen.